This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Healthcare is complicated, but does it need to be? Today, Where We Live, we break down what the presidential candidates have been saying about reforming the nation's health insurance system. Coming up, the president of Connecticut, a Connecticut-based insurer, will join us to give his take on reform proposals. We'll also consider why the public option has become so controversial. Are you listening on the way to the public library? Do you send your children to public school? Maybe listening to the podcast on public transit. How are those public options working out for you? You can join us. We have a new toll-free number, 888-720-WNPR. That's 888-720-9677. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, We wanted to first start with what the candidates for uh, the president's uh, race are saying, the Democratic candidates, rather. Uh, Joining us from NPR's Washington, D.C. studios is Emery Hudeman, who's a reporter for Kaiser Health News. Emery, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I I laughed out loud. Uh, There's a line in one of your uh, most recent stories after the recent uh, presidential debate where you said there are almost as many versions of Medicare for all as there are Democratic candidates. And each one thinks (laughs) their plan is the path to ensuring every American. Uh, So before we get into the details of what each candidate is proposing, let's just start out with just a a, a definition of what the Medicare program is, who it covers, and how it works. So the Medicare program, as many older Americans are familiar, is our um, our government-run health care system for seniors in this country. If you're over 65, you qualify for Medicare. There's also some other groups who qualify based on disabilities or uh, or diseases that they're dealing with. And it's it's a very popular program. It covers a lot of people. It's one of the largest health care programs in the country, perhaps the largest, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they, they provide health care that lots of seniors like a lot and are very protective of. And so there's a bunch of health, uh, a bunch of presidential candidates now who are looking at potential for health care plans and saying, well, we've got this very popular program in the United States. Why not build off of that? So when they say, uh, let's start with uh, Bernie Sanders, when he talks about Medicare for all, uh, what does he mean exactly? Is there room for private insurers? In Bernie Sanders' plan, no, there isn't room for private insurers. Private insurers would actually be prohibited from competing with the government plan under Bernie Sanders' plan. Uh, it's kind of considered the gold, the gold standard of Medicare for all. He's had it out for he's had this plan out for a while. He's introduced it in multiple Congresses, and now as a presidential candidate again. And um, basically, uh, it's the kind of program where uh, the government would be the single payer. And other private insurance companies would have to fall by the wayside um, in favor of a, this government-run program that had much expanded benefits compared to what we have now. Um, and there would be some room on the side, I guess I should say, for, for smaller insurance plans that you could purchase. Uh, when those get talked about right now, they mostly refer to things like if you wanted coverage for cosmetic surgery, for example, you could buy a private insurance plan, which, of course, we don't have right now. So he describes that as Medicare for all, really a single payer system, uh, saying Medicare for all more palatable to the public who have concerns about single payer or uh, government run insurance. I'd say so. It's all about which words you use to describe your plan if you're trying to communicate an idea to people. And uh, in Bernie Sanders' case, I think he looked at how popular the Medicare program is and how effective it is in many ways and decided that that was the best way to describe what he was trying to do for the American health care system. It doesn't look exactly the same as the Medicare system we have right now, uh, but that is the term that he uses to define it. And so the Medicare system we have now uh, coming up, we're going to hear from the health care advocate for Connecticut, who uh, used to also be a senior official at the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We're going to take a deeper dive on that with Ted Doolittle. But uh, just, uh, you know, just generally, uh, Medicare may be run by the government, but they're contracting out to uh, uh, private companies to provide that care to Americans. Right. Right. There are private companies that get to provide health insurance plans according to the Medicare mandate and, and the guidelines of the Medicare program. Uh, and they compete for for customers the same way that other private insurers do. Um, but the government is the uh, wields the power ultimately over what happens in those Medicare programs and um, and does a lot of the paying. And then Elizabeth Warren on the same page as uh, Bernie Sanders, but Kamala Harris, her Medicare for all is a little bit different than their plan. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Kamala Harris's plan, she also calls it Medicare for all, um, looks different than Bernie Sanders' plan, to say the least. Uh, Her plan involves a role for private insurers. That's actually the big difference that we keep hearing about. 
Um, under under Kamala Harris's plan, Medicare for all um, uh, and private insurers, you'd have uh, excuse me, you'd have private insurers who are providing their own Medicare plans um, under the government plan. And um, and basically, you'd have you'd have the option of being covered just by Medicare. In fact, under the Kamala Harris plan, immediately you could enroll in Medicare, no matter who you were. Uh, however, it would be a 10 year phase in. And like I said, private insurers would be able to create their own plans that adhere to the strict cost and benefit requirements um, that she would outline as president. Uh, on the, uh, with us from NPR's uh, DC studios is Emery Hudeman, reporter for Kaiser Health News. Uh, she's uh, talking about uh, the different proposals that the Democratic uh, presidential candidates have uh, to reform uh, the health care system in our country. Um, if you uh, want to chime in, we have a new toll free number. Uh, that number again is 888 720 WMPR or 888 720 9677. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Where We Live. Uh, when we think about uh, Vice President, former Vice President uh, Joe Biden, he's actually talking more about a, a, a better public option. So uh, how does his plan differ from the other, other candidates? So one word you hear used a lot when people talk about Joe Biden's plan is incremental. This is referring to the fact that rather than coming in with a plan like Medicare for all, that would cause that would require broad scale reform um, of the entire health care system. He's talking about a plan that would make a lot of changes to the existing Affordable Care Act system. That being said, the public option is anything but incremental. Um, it's been a very controversial idea in recent in recent years in particular, we can think about going back to the Affordable Care Act fight. Uh, however, under the Joe Biden plan, there would be a public option that was paid for by the government, like Medicare, and anyone would be eligible for it. There would still be um, the option for private insurance as the system exists now, but other changes his plan would make would include um, increasing the subsidies that certain people could use to pay for their insurance plans, trying to get at that that percentage of Americans who, even if they have insurance, um, are just perhaps one medical medical bill away from not being able to pay an economic hardship. So trying to find a way to boost those folks and make it easier for them to pay for their health insurance. The other the other aspect of his plan, it would reduce the percentage of your um, of your income that you could spend on premiums. So basically, some changes to how the Affordable Care Act works right now, but also adding in that public option. Uh, when we think about uh, a majority of uh, majority, about a half of Americans get their uh, insurance from employer uh, sponsored insurance plans. So is that worrisome uh, to some Americans who uh, maybe are happy with uh, their plan and are, are a little worried about how they've seen ACA uh, play out in terms of, of uh, premiums uh, going up each year? Absolutely. There are many concerns among people who who are on employer-based insurance, as you said, are roughly half Americans, and it's relatively popular. When you talk to people, they like their private insurance plans, too. Um, so, of course, this causes some some concern. And, of course, there'd be concern with any huge change to the system. But there are people who are saying, I like my insurance. And, you know, we had this big fight under Obama about his, his famous phrase, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. If you like your insurance, you can keep it. And there are folks who are looking at that, remembering that, and thinking, uh, I'm looking at this Medicare for all idea, and I'm not entirely sure I, I like it because I want to keep my employer insurance, for instance. Um, under under the Harris plan, she claims that there would still be a role for employers, that they could basically join the Medicare system as she was creating it and, um, and provide their own plans. But it doesn't look you know, like necessarily private insurers would have as much clout under a Kamala Harris plan, which is why you see a lot of concern from insurance companies about these Medicare for all ideas. Uh, Emery, we got a, a tweet from a listener who writes, uh, "Husband, uh, she and her husband are both self-employed, and so far this year they've paid $28,000 for health care premiums, and they still haven't met their high deductible. So at some point, uh, you know, reform needs to happen to help people who don't want to go into bankruptcy. We hear these stories, uh, um, and oftentimes uh, Americans look to what European countries have, a single-payer system. How are they able to make uh, these systems uh, uh, or public option be uh, able to sit aside next to private insurers? How do their plans work exactly? So I'll take Germany, for example. Germany has something that's called a universal multi-payer healthcare system. 
they still have private insurers. In addition, um, it's just that the government uh, has has a much bigger role, makes those plans not not for profit as one requirement, for instance. Um, what you see in Germany, though, is um, all all Germans are paying a percentage of all German employees, excuse me, are paying a percentage of their income uh, to pay for insurance in their country into a big pot, um, and that fu- that money goes to to pay for people's health insurance on a on a countrywide level. Um, it's just that if you don't if you don't make very much money, you're not paying as much money. You're just paying that same percentage that someone who makes a lot more than you is paying into the program. Uh, when we think about, again, uh, what other countries are doing, uh, again, uh, less cost, better outcomes, it's hard to argue uh, with that. But uh, when we think about the opposition in this country looking at uh, they don't want to see the system change, uh, w- the talk uh, through some of their points uh, of what they're, why they're concerned about these proposals that the Democratic candidates are putting forth. So what you'll hear very often in the midst of this debate is uh, this is America. We have outstanding quality, outstanding coverage in this country. Um, But it's hard to make that argument to a lot of folks who, you know, can't pay their bills and can't access that that outstanding coverage in many cases or that outstanding provider in many cases. Um, So there's a lot of concerns that um, the way we could shift the costs and the way that the program would look underneath by trying to move, to import something from a European country, for example, or by trying to put in Medicare for all. There's a lot of concern about how would that affect the ability for people to access good quality doctors? Because you do have problems, say in Germany, for instance, where folks might encounter long waits in order to get into the doctor. That being said, we do have long waits in this country as well. For any anyone who knows that who's tried to get in to see a specialist recently, um, so there are ups and downs on all, all sides of this, and uh, and there's going to be a lot more debate. One of the things that we're going to have to talk more about is what specifically these plans will do, because while we do have details, at this point, not all the details are fleshed out. Uh, Daria is joining us here on Where We Live from Vernon. Daria, go ahead. Daria, are you there? Oh, it looks like uh, Daria uh, can't hear me right now, so hopefully we'll take her call in just a little bit. You know, while we're talking about all of these uh, different uh, proposals out there from the Democratic candidates, uh, Emery, uh, there's also still uh, lawsuits uh, winding through courts looking at uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, Republican Attorney General saying it's unconstitutional. Um, you know, so if the ACA is also something that uh, a portion of Americans think uh, uh, is not sustainable, isn't working, what are the alternatives? The alternatives to the ACA as they stand right now, uh, I think we just talked about several mm-hmm. of the plans that have been put forward. The Republicans, as we know, in 2017 tried to pass a replacement plan through Congress. It failed. Um, and they haven't put back up a new plan at this point. There's um, a number of um, of proposals that they have made, they being Republicans in Congress, um, that would address certain pieces of what would fall if uh, if the Affordable Care Act were to fall. But it's it's largely the Democrats right now who are agitating for that for that particular issue. They're saying, hey. All these Republican attorneys general went to went to court and said that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional and they're trying to take the entire system down. Think of how disruptive that would be if our entire health care system were suddenly ruled unconstitutional. That's the argument that Democrats keep making. And their point is there aren't that many fixes in place. We're trying to um, I'm speaking for the Democrats here. The Democrats say we're trying to propose uh, ideas to, you know, protect pre-existing conditions, since that's a big thing that would fall if the Affordable Care Act were to fall. Um, And they put forward a lot of other ideas. Republicans at this point haven't put forward as many ideas. Mm -hmm. So long story short, Mm -hmm. if this if this were to fall, there aren't a whole lot of plans that are out there that could potentially step in and take the place of our current health care system. Ben's calling from Wallingford. Ben, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Tell us what your question is. First, I'd like to say that the main opposition to this is corporations that are making money off sick people. So I just wonder why more employers aren't in favor of Medicare for all due to the price reductions that they would get from not having to pay parts of the premiums and also employ someone to administer the health care for their employees. I just think that businesses could like help their bottom line by supporting Medicare for all. Uh, thank you, Ben, uh, for your call. Uh, Emery, did you want to respond? Absolutely. That's that's a very good point, Ben, actually. Um, what I would say is the, one of the reasons that employers are, are hesitant about this plan is that 
health care benefits in this country have long been a way to attract the best um, to your business. Um, it's In fact, health care is considered one of the most popular benefits to offer your employees if you're trying to attract good talent. So it takes that that piece out of their arsenal. And we have had an employer-based health care system in this country for the better part of a century at this point. Um, and uh, that would be a pretty big change for how employers go about um, taking care of their employees and also attracting new employees. Um, there are some employers who are looking at this and saying, OK, if this happens, maybe we'll just cut back a little bit. We'll give that money directly to employees as you know, a subsidy to help pay for their health care. Uh, but at this point, there's a lot of there are a lot of reservations, as Ben said. Uh, Emory Hudeman again is reporter for Kaiser Health News, joining us from NPR's uh, DC studios. Uh, Emory, thanks for joining us today on Where We Live. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to hear from the president of Connecticut, a Connecticut-based insurer, about these reform proposals that Emory spelled out. We also want to hear from you. What plans do you think would help improve the health care system in the U.S.? Join us. 888-720-WMPR. That's 888-720-9677. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We just got a breakdown from Kaiser Health News on the health care reform proposals being floated by Democratic presidential candidates. Now, what plans would you support? You can join our conversation. Again, we have a new phone number that is 888-720-WMPR or 888-720-9677. As always, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Now, we wanted to hear from an insurance company about these reform ideas out there. Uh, one of the few that got back to us was Connecticut. Eric Galvin is in studio with me. He's president of Connecticut. Eric, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you're a Connecticut-based insurer. Uh, tell us uh, how many uh, people your company uh, insures in Connecticut and surrounding areas. Oh, sure. Well, um, so Connecticut has been around since uh, the early 80s. We're really, we view ourselves as, and the public typically views us as Connecticut's insurer. Um, we're very proud to have that um, that background, that lineage, and um, you know we we take it very seriously. Uh, we support um, uh, about two hundred fifty thousand Connecticut um, workers and residents uh, through our insurance programs, and then um, about a half a million people through um, other wellness types of um, services that we provide. Uh, so uh, you um, provide insurance through, say, employer-sponsored uh, plans, but also you're uh, one of two that provide insurance on the individual marketplace. Uh, that's right. We've been on the uh, the individual exchange and also off of the exchange. We, we sell through both channels and service people through both channels um, really since the very beginning. So um, so starting 2014, including some years that we really you know struggled with um, with that that um, pool of risk. Um, it's, uh, there's been a lot of disruption and there's been a lot of um, uncertainty. And so we really felt that it was an important thing for us to, to stay and um, stay on, on that exchange and, uh, and help service the people of the, of the state of Connecticut. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk also about the Medicare Advantage program, which I also believe uh, Connecticut is involved in. But let's talk about uh, the Affordable Care Act. You mentioned um, dealing with the risk pool again uh, with ACA. When there was a mandate, everyone had to have insurance, so you had healthy and people that may have chronic conditions right. or uh, just not uh, doing well uh, in terms of their health. Uh, but as you look at the ACA in, in 2019, uh, the at-risk pool definitely is more. A, a, a proportion than those that are healthy on what that you're covering? Yeah, so we have definitely seen that. So as the uh, individual mandate um, was uh, taken away and really more the, the penalties around um, the individual mandate have been taken away, we've certainly seen people who are healthier um, leave the pool. Um, at the same time, we've seen uh, very different changes and some um, negative changes in, uh, in the way that the subsidies work. Um, and the overall premiums have been continuing to rise, rise, rise. And um, it's a topic that I'm very eager to talk about here is really the underlying problem here is is the cost of care. It's not 
um, the financing components, although the, they create some problems in of themselves, but the underlying cost of care has been uh, has been increasing far too quickly. Um, getting back to really, so why um, why are the subsidies uh, an important issue? Is that it's actually created a new um, a new pool of people who are uninsured, and these are individuals that make more than four hundred percent of the federal poverty level and uh, don't receive a subsidy. And as a result, they, um, they can't afford their premiums. And so um, that, that's where the, there's an imbalance in the system that really needs to be addressed so that um, people who want and, uh, and today can't afford um, coverage, that they can access that at something that is a, a little bit more palatable for their, uh, their wallet. You're talking about the cost. Uh, the insurance department recently approving an average 27.7% increase for Connecticut individual policies sold on the exchange. Uh, you've seen, you've asked for rate hikes uh, throughout uh, each year because of the high cost, because of what you have to then uh, pay out uh, to cover people with, uh, you know, serious issues? Yeah, so just uh, on that fact, um, so the exchange rate increase hasn't been um, approved yet. It was submitted and it's actually a, a relatively low from historical standards. Um, it's in the uh, it's in the you know single digits. Um, there will be information. That was in 2018. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's 2018. There'll be informational um, uh, rate hearings coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, the reason why, if you look historically at the um, the rate changes. It comes down to the underlying cost of care. Um, you know, one one of the things that is a very common um, misconception is that um, insurance companies quote make so much money, and the the reality is um, that that we don't. And I'm not trying to defend something that is, you, you know, um, an unpopular position. What what I'm really just trying to do is educate um, uh, the the public that. Um, there's a really very, very low um, margin, if you want to uh, you want to think of it that way, re related to our insurance products, like mm -hmm. very low single digit um, percentages. So when you talk about insurance companies yeah. aren't making a lot of money, are you talking specifically about, say, Connecticut versus an Aetna? Because people remember how much uh, Bertolini makes in terms of his salary. Yeah. yeah. So it's um, it's more about. Well, so certainly I'm speaking from a Connecticut point of view, number one. But number two is. Um, you know, we're required to spend um, either 80 or 85 percent of every premium dollar on um, on cost of care. And frankly, we we spend more than that um, as a as an entity. And so, again, I think it's a little bit of more education and sharing um, that the 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 dollar that someone spends on a, on a medical premium, um, the vast majority of that dollar goes to um, the actual care that's delivered. And then, you know, as as you all know, and, and as we've we've already heard a little bit from uh, from your show this morning, there's a tremendous amount of uh, of regulatory change, and uh, and it, it's expensive to keep up with. Um, so as you think about new regulation that comes out, um, the Affordable Care Act, while you know the mo most significant pieces were implemented in 2014, there has not been a change. Um, excuse me, there has not been a year that there isn't change um, to the Affordable Care Act. And so every year, every season, it's about keeping step with what are the new requirements. And those things, um, those things are expensive. Eric Galvin is president of Connecticut uh, here on Where We Live as we talk about uh, different proposals uh, to reform uh, health care in our country. You can join us. Uh, uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You know, I'm curious, uh, when we were hearing from the proposals from the Democratic candidates, uh, some being Medicare for all, some being a public option, when you talk about the costs that need to be reined in, Eric, so what is the fix? Yeah, so um, first and foremost, it just... Yeah, you know, if you think about a, a Medicare program, and if you were, say, for instance, someone who um, runs a physician's um, office or a hospital, um, you, one reality that you would face every day is the fact that um, Medicare reimburses or pays you less than it costs you to deliver care, and then Medicaid um, much lower than that still. So where the um, the um, equation gets balanced is through the commercial markets. So if, um, if any either state um, or federally, if we were to adopt a Medicare for all type of a, of a scenario, what you would see is 
um, you would see the hospitals, the the doctor's offices, they would struggle. They would start to close programs, ultimately start to close buildings. And, and, you know, ultimately, I think they would have to make a hard decision as to whether they can continue to operate. And again, it comes down to the the cost imbalance. Um, The federal government and state governments get to decide what the rates are. And then if, um, if, you know, a hospital or a doctor's office can't operate within that, um, that parameter, then, then they have to get it somewhere else and they get it from the commercial markets today. So that's first and foremost something that has to be addressed is why does it cost so much to deliver care? Um, it's one of the only industries that I'm aware of that um, a introduction of a new technology actually increased cost over time instead of decreased costs over time. And we, we have many examples from our own you know, lives as consumers that when a new technology comes out, yes, it might be expensive, but then over time, it really, it really moderates. You think about electronics, you mm-hmm. think about um, things like that. So. so can I ask why mm-hmm. then are you know, European countries like uh, the UK and Australia able to provide uh, government uh, health plans with private insurers mm-hmm. also there if people want to opt in to get other coverage? Why are they able to do it at less cost and they're getting better outcomes? Well, so first, um, and, and I've, I've been in a global role before, so I've, I've seen some of this firsthand. I, I would tell you if you, you know, uh, you spoke about uh, Germany or earlier, um, and uh, or you look at the UK. There are um, there are private insurers that provide supplemental benefits or entirely um, private solutions for people who might be able to afford those solutions, because the the government provided um, programs uh, really do create some challenges for people, especially people who are ill. So you know if you um, if you need something like an MRI, you're going to wait a significant amount of time. Here in the United States, there's uh, there's more MRI capacity than there has ever been, and um, and so that's something that's very readily available. You can get an appointment um, really very quickly. So it, it's it's um, it's really the European countries, if or Australia as we're using as examples, um, the. Uh, the experience for the individual is dramatically different. And, and when you, you know, would talk to someone from those countries, they may not know anything different, but they also know that um, others within that country have access to a private system, which might actually be um, private hospitals, private um, you know, physicians' offices, et cetera. And, and so there is um, very much a, a, a tale of two cities in, the, in those countries. You can join our conversation, 888-720-WMPR. Uh, this is where we live. In studio with me, Eric Galvin, president of Connecticut. Uh, calling in right now is State Senator Matt Lesser. Uh, Senator Lesser, go ahead. Well, thank you so much. This is a wonderful uh, show. It was uh, great to tune in. Um, one of the things that we're, we're looking at in Connecticut is we're watching uh, what's happening nationally. And as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Lucy, the uh, Trump administration is in federal court right now, uh, tr- trying uh, still uh, to strike down the entire Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, if they succeed, and it looks like they might, uh, 20 million Americans would lose coverage overnight. Um, I have pre-existing conditions. I know many uh, of your listeners do. Uh, we would uh, potentially lose uh, coverage, or at least the guarantee of coverage. Things like lifetime and annual caps would uh, come back. Uh, and sitting in you know in, in Hartford uh, at the state capitol trying to figure out what we should do we I was talking to my uh, co-chair representative Sean Scanlon and I uh, who are chairs of the insurance committee uh, really looked at the question and we said we could either sit back and do nothing or we could really uh, say that maybe some of these health reforms that people are talking about nationally maybe they are something we should look at uh, at the state level and, and working with Governor Lamont uh, this year we we unveiled something called the Connecticut option um, and and the idea there was to focus on where the big problems are in healthcare, and the ACA has done a lot to reduce uh, the uninsured rate in Connecticut uh, to make sure that more people have coverage. Um, but uh, what we're hearing is what your listeners are probably experiencing, which is over the last few years, premiums have been uh, rising up. Uh, the uninsured rate has ticked up a little bit. Uh, but there are an awful lot of people out there, particularly who work for small businesses uh, or families uh, purchasing healthcare on their own, 
uh, who have coverage but can't afford to use it because prescription drug costs are too high uh, or because the deductibles are just simply too high. Uh, so what we did was we set it out a challenge to try to lower costs by 20% uh, for small businesses and for families. Uh, and part of that is a public option. Uh, but part of it is also bringing in cheaper uh, prescription drugs from Canada and changing the way, working with companies like Kineticare, uh, to change the way we pay for health care, mm. to switch to value-based health care. Senator, so uh, really yeah. Senator Lesser, really Senator Lesser, so the public option didn't go through uh, this year. Kineticare was one of several insurance companies that signed a letter urging the governor not to respond. Why would this public option, say a public option, why would this Connecticut option not work for you, your, you and your company, Eric Galvin? Well, so... Um, and Senator, uh, good good talking to you this morning. Um, what I would say first and foremost is um, the the cost element of this equation is really where we're going to succeed or fail as a as a society, frankly. So if we don't address the um, the cost side of this, we'll continue to see what we're seeing, which is this. Um, you know, year over year, significant increase in in the uh, in in the cost of uh, care being delivered. So, what what might a solution be? A solution um, is, and you know, some of the conversation around the Connecticut option was, is there a way to create um, a, a set of reimbursement, whether that be through value based design, whether it be through um, maybe some limited networks, um, which, you know, again, um, they're all they all have pros and cons. Um, and could you achieve um, a goal of of twenty percent um, or more? Um, I don't want to make this a commercial for for Connecticut, uh, but we, what we have been able to do as a company is um, is create a solution for small businesses that does achieve that twenty to thirty percent. But it's not right for everybody, right? And and um, you know, as you think about um, mechanisms like high deductible um, plans, which I know is, is a, um, a topic that the senator is passionate about, um, that's just a financing vehicle to make the premium um, more affordable. But to the, to the point, when you go to use it, now you have a, a big deductible. If you take a step back and you just think about what is the cost of the entire pie that you're trying to to finance, that's really where the work um, is. That's why um, I have teamed up with uh, Jess Kupek, um, who's the now former, uh, recently retired CEO of St. Francis Healthcare Partners, and he and I um, co-chair a, a work group for the Connecticut Health Council on value-based um, relationships with payers and providers. It's um, it's the first step of I think many where we can uh, move away from volume based reimbursement and get to something that is focused on the patient, puts them in the middle, um, is highly efficient, and as a result lowers cost um, for the for the individuals. So a lot there, but I, I think it, there's not one component that is a um, you know, is a solution, a panacea, if you will. It's going to be a collection of a lot of things, and it's going to take the entire ecosystem coming together. Mm -hmm. But this bill, uh, thank you, Senator Lester, for calling in. Uh, before we move on, this Connecticut option bill would have forced insurers uh, to lower premiums by 20 percent. So it would have been a mandate for you. Well, um, the the way that the bill was constructed, it, it, it was it was less about mandating that the premiums come down 20 percent. It was more about um, how are you going to create a solution that can lower premiums by 20 percent? And the reason that that distinction is important is, um, you know, there was very much a, a, a dialogue about would the state themselves look to create the contracts with providers? Is that a solution here? Um, and that's something that, you know, very much like Medicare Advantage, um, where the federal government um, – they set reimbursement rates. They set the the rates that uh, docs are paid or a, ho a hospital is paid, and then um, private insurers um, facilitate that that program. Um, and people choose more based on the experience they get, mm -hmm. um, the support that they get, um, which is why we have fifty thousand Medicare Advantage members in the, in the state. So um, that's really th those were parts of the conversation around the Connecticut option. Um, it's extremely complicated. It was a very, um, um, it was a very tight time frame. But also, I think you know, as we get into this next legislative um, session and as we go forward, 
again, if we're not focused on the cost and we're we're simply focused on the benefits, I think we'll ultimately lose this game, which is why um, organizations like Kinetic Care are so hyper-focused on cost. We want to talk more about uh, the public option, the idea of public options. Uh, joining us by phone now, Ganesh Siddharaman, professor of law at Vanderbilt University and co-author of Public Option, How to Expand Freedom, Increase Opportunity, and Promote Equality. Ganesh, are you there? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, for holding on. Uh, you know, the, the idea of a public option has really become politicized when we think about health care. Uh, you write, especially in a New York Times op-ed, uh, that public options have been uh, in this country uh, for many years. Give us some examples on how they can successfully coexist along private options. So when you think about a public option, all it really is is a government-provided good or service that's available to everyone at a reasonable price, maybe even free. Uh, And it coexists with a private opt-out. And we actually have these everywhere in our society. A public swimming pool is a public option. Lots of people have private swimming pools. We have public libraries, and there are private universities that have private libraries. Uh, We have public transit, and people have private cars. Um, There are lots of places from golf courses to basketball courts to public schools Uh, that are all public options, and a lot of these have been with us for hundreds of years in some cases. So when we think about uh, public options existing alongside the private market, you know, this can encourage uh, uh, healthy competition, but if the the government's involved uh, trying to bring in efficiencies, that doesn't always uh, equate to uh, quality, does it, Ganesh? So one of the things that's great about a public option is that it provides a level of service or a good or a product to everyone, and that it expands freedom and equality by doing so. But that doesn't mean that what's available in the marketplace overall is only the public option. Um, So if you think about schools, uh, everyone has access to a public school. uh, But if you want to go to a public school or you want your kids to go to a public school, you're not going to be able to have them be educated in Catholic teachings, for example. Um, but you could opt out and go to a Catholic school, have your kids go to a Catholic school. And that's just really a different kind of good or service. And in a lot of areas where we have public options, uh, that's what happens. Um, a, pu- a public pr- a swimming pool and a private swimming pool are very, very different things. One's in your backyard, one's open to lots of people in your town. Uh, those are different kinds of goods, and that often happens when we have a public option coexisting with private options. Mm. Uh, when we think about uh, competition, uh, is the concern from the insurance lobby that uh, this would lead to some insurance, insurance companies having to close? They wouldn't be able to sustain uh, in the marketplace. Well, one of the questions I think always with public options is how much do we want to ensure that everyone has access at a controlled price to to some kind of good or service? And in cases where there are really important uh, goods for moral reasons, um, for economic reasons, uh, we've often said as a society that it's okay. We want to have a system where there's universal access. So uh, a couple of examples, if you think about the the post office, um, you can send a letter for, you know, for 50 cents uh, to anywhere in the country. Uh, and we actually don't allow private competition on that part of it. Um, but there is competition on package delivery, short-term, two-day uh, turnaround with companies like FedEx and UPS. Um, but that's a place where a long time ago as a country, we said it should be possible for anyone affordably to be able to send mail to anywhere in the country because it's essential for communications in a large, sprawling nation. So that's part of a judgment call that we have to make as a society. How important is the issue for us? Um, And I think that's what we're seeing right now in debates over health care, a question of, you know, how much are we willing to to commit to to making sure that everybody has access to health care? Well, Ganesh Siddharaman, again, is professor of law at Vanderbilt University, co-author of Public Option, How to Expand Freedom, Increase Opportunity, and Promote Equality. Uh, Ganesh, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. Eric Galvin in studio with me, president of Connecticut. After the break, uh, we're going to hear from the health care advocate for Connecticut about um, other ways, uh, especially how Medicare uh, is run. And is that an option for other people as uh, the Democratic uh, presidential candidates uh, talk about so-called Medicare for all? You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. <music> Thank you. 
This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about uh, ideas out there to reform uh, the U.S. health care system. Uh, Daria is calling in from Vernon. Daria, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm actually pretty for Medicare for all. And I guess my, my reasons behind that are pretty simple. Um, if, if I knew that I would only have to pay a little, a reasonably higher tax, if I knew that not a single person in this country would have to pay a premium, a uh, copay, um, you know, anything in addition, uh, and they would be, you know, safe from health issues and stress, then I would be willing to do that. Um, but a lot of people don't really consider the the farther um, reach of Medicare for all. If everyone has access to health care, uh, preventative care is probably going to soar, in my opinion. There's many people who I've met, where I'm friends with, who, you know, they avoid seeing doctors until they're very, very ill, until it's something that they can't wait and put off any longer. And a lot of times by then it's too late, and I've seen it firsthand. It, it being too late for people in a sense where they're literally terminal by the time they actually see a specialist. And I believe that if everyone in this country had access to preventative care, that we would see a huge decrease in hospitalization. Um, there would be just, honestly, I think it would just improve everyone's life in, in way, more ways than health. Mm. Stress is one of the main concerns that I have because you have people deciding whether they're going to pay their medical bills or they're going to pay their rent. And to me, that's going to make you sicker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, emotional health matters, and it actually affects your physical health. And when people are stressed like this, if I didn't have to hear another terrible story about someone suffering because their bills are making them homeless, I would be willing to pay more. And that's just my personal feeling. Well, thank you, Daria. Very passionate. And we thank you for calling in uh, saying she wouldn't mind paying more tax as long as uh, people had access to health care. Uh, she mentions Medicare for all. I want to uh, welcome into the studio now a Ted Doolittle, health care advocate for Connecticut. He was also a former senior official at the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Ted, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. So you actually wrote an op-ed uh, talking about uh, what exactly it means uh, when they when candidates say Medicare for all. Uh, some uh, candidates talking about they'd want to eliminate private insurers, but you said there's a lot of misinformation out there with how Medicare actually works. So tell us, like, what are some of the main points that you wanted to, to bring up related when people hear Medicare for all? Sure. Well, I, I joined uh, the CMS as a senior official, as you mentioned, and I thought I knew a lot about health care. But when I got there, I found out that CMS has uh, today uh, 6,200 employees, which is probably comparable to uh, Connecticut, I would guess. The only difference being that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, has a budget of just under a trillion dollars. So each man and woman who is working for CMS is responsible for spending like $160 million or so, which is over 100 times what we see with the other health insurers. If you have an Aetna or Cigna, um, you're talking about em employees there who are overseeing revenues of of, of like one million or one and a half million per employee. Now, can 6,200 people really run one twentieth of the nation's economy? Because one trillion dollars is, is, is one twentieth of our GDP. Well, they can't. How do they do it? They hire private companies, including all the insurance companies. All the, ins the major insurance companies have Medicare contracts, but there's a huge uh, uh, ecosystem of private uh, companies, and these are for-profit companies, so uh, one thing I would like people to know is that Medicare itself is delivered by private industry. It's funded by the government. It's administered by the government, overseen by the government. But it really is delivered by private for-profit companies. And so if folks are concerned about creeping socialism or big government, uh, they shouldn't be concerned about Medicare. They should, in fact, be endorsing Medicare because Medicare is largely run by private uh, companies. Uh, we, we heard earlier from Eric Galvin, who's in studio with us, president of Connecticut, about uh, costs needing to be reined in. Um, if there were a, a Medicare for all uh, in uh, the, the U.S., uh, what would that mean for, say, hospitals? How would they fare in terms of thinking about the government being able to negotiate uh, costs? Would we see uh, more hospitals closing? Uh, you know, it would it would really have to depend on the specifics. Uh, obviously, if uh, 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 if you were to to cut healthcare expenditures overnight, you would have to that would be somebody's income would be cut. I mean, my cost is your 
revenue, your family, my family's cost is, is, is your family's income. Uh, so we do have to have a thoughtful plan on how to go about it. Um, uh, uh, there are ways to make sure that hospitals do get reimbursed uh, cr- uh, cr- appropriately and pharmaceuticals do get reimbursed appropriately. Other countries do it. They give the same quality care for half the price. So uh, America can get there. I really endorse uh, what Eric Galvin, who's, who I partner with uh, a lot, and Connecticut really, in my view, is the first among equals of the insurers in Connecticut in terms of community orientation and, and, and progress orientation. So I really appreciate his comments about co- the underlying cost of care. That's where we do have to focus. It is true that the insurers are part of the ecosystem. Eric acknowledged that. We do need to make fundamental change because we know that at the end of the day, by any quality measure, when we look overseas to our economic competitors, they're eating our lunch. They're delivering the same quality health care uh, for half the price. Uh, Eric Alvin, who's in studio with us again, as I mentioned, uh, you are also, Connecticut also participates in Medicare Advantage. Uh, there's been talk about maybe allowing uh, other Americans beyond the, uh, to be underneath that uh, age limit uh, to uh, join in. Would that be something that Connecticut would, would uh, encourage or want to see happen? Well, again, I, I just go back to um, the, the way that doctors and hospitals get paid. Um, under Medicare Advantage is the same as it is under what would be referred to as original Medicare, parts A and B. Um, And, um, you know, without a change to the way that those doctors and hospitals are paid, then uh, we we would see exactly the the pressures that we described um, we talked a a little bit about earlier. Um, You know, Medicare Advantage is a a great program, I think, um, really helps the, the seniors and, and others that are eligible to have what they might have become used to in the commercial market. And, and so it's a good bridge into, um, into you know, in many cases, um, seniors' years. Um, but again, if we were to uh, apply this to everyone, then we, we would really have a lot of pressure on the what, what we would refer to as sort of the delivery of care. Um, and making sure that um, that, that people have access to uh, affordable care. Uh, Ted Doolittle, we just have a, a couple of minutes. So uh, when we talk about uh, cost of care, uh, delivery of services, you know, you know, what is the fix uh, from the Office of Healthcare Advocate perspective? Well, uh, there, there, it, we do have to start getting serious about uh, grappling with pharma and grappling with the hospitals. Absolutely 100% true, and we have danced around that issue in this country for 40 years. Let's just be blunt. And that includes the uh, Affordable Care Act. It didn't get there. Uh, I would say this. In terms of all the flavors, we talked about the flavors of Medicare expansion. All the flavors of it, you know, uh, could make progress. And I would say this to folks out there. I've just explained that Medicare is delivered by the private sector, it can be delivered uh, out of the Baltimore headquarters of, of, of Medicare, where it is now, or it can be delivered in Connecticut. Any type of expansion, to me, is a huge economic opportunity for Connecticut. We're well poised. We're the insurance capital. We have the expertise. We, folks like Eric and his team, if, if uh, any type of Medicare expansion uh, passes, I would urge him to be on the next plane down there, along with our senior Democratic uh, co- delegation, because in that environment, it will be a Democratic president uh, to make sure that Connecticut gets its share of what would be a dramatic expansion in private sector employment. So to me, there is this, uh, this underlying opportunity that folks aren't talking about. If we do this transition, Connecticut is poised to become a leader in whatever the Medicare expansion uh, flavor of the day is. And with the federal government involved, uh, it has the power to negotiate better prices. You would see a cost come down. That's right. But it could be done rationally, Lucy. It doesn't mean that, uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, Dick Blumenthal or Chris Murphy is going to stand by and watch Hartford Healthcare go down the tubes. That's not going to happen. It's, it, I believe we're going to be able to, to put this country on a glide path. Now, this is not a one-year project. It's not a two-year project. This, to me, is a 20-year project that the community has to undergo to transform to a, a lower-cost uh, healthcare system. But it can be done. It can't be done by steady as she goes, though. 
I want to thank Ted Doolittle for coming in, healthcare advocate for Connecticut. Also, Eric Galvin for being with us, president of Connecticut Connecticut. Thanks very much for coming in today. Uh, Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Uh, Thanks to our technical producer, Kion Wolf, Lydia Brown on the phones. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.